I spent like two and a half years not making any money and just like working on myself as an individual and trying to craft my writing, develop my voice as a writer, work on my manuscript, like Instagram, X, threads, like these places will be beautiful avenues that make it really easy to connect with other people. The Young Pueblo audience, it's about 3.4, 3.5 million people now across all the networks. Having sold a million books after having become a number one New York Times bestseller, it's just allowed me to speak to investors in a way they really take you seriously. Diego, I've been looking forward to this for months. I have been following you for years. I think uh, probably since like 2016. Oh, wow. Yeah. 2017, early days when I remember you were the first person I'd heard talk about self-love. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't. Oh, wow. That's that's really um shocking because I, I didn't know you were following for that long. I've been following you, I think, for about two years. It was funny because it was at a time when I was first starting my venture capital company. I, everything you were saying about uh, startups, I was like just eating it all up. I wanted to kick it off by just trying to understand... Mm -hmm your business empire? My main thing is um, I write under the name Young Pueblo. I think I started taking it really seriously around 2015. That was my primary focus for until about 2020 when I started opening up and getting into the venture capital world. But the Young Pueblo work, it's basically... It stems from like the development of my personal life where I you know, used to be just quite a big mess. Like I was you know, partying all the time, just um, pushing my body to the edge as much as much as possible. I really hit a wall and a rock bottom point where I almost lost my life. And when I realized that I couldn't push myself any further, I was like, I need to start accepting, you know, what's happening inside of me, like these emotions that I'm trying to ignore. I ended up, you know, like changing my habits, like changing how I ate, changing the way I interact with people. I eventually started meditating. When I started meditating, I realized that the big changes were happening inside of me where my mind felt a lot less intense than it used to. And I didn't have as intense reactions when, you know, difficult situations would arise. So to me, all those changes were really surprising. Another byproduct of that was that my creativity started blossoming in a way where it never had before. And I started writing. And that's really where um, Young Pueblo came about. And I've, I've since released um, three books. I have a fourth one coming out. It was sometime during 2020 when I felt like something was missing. I was like, you know, I, I love this work that I'm doing. I love writing books, but I also want to be able to help people in other ways. And then this idea came forward to build Wisdom Ventures, which is basically a venture capital company that's trying to invest in companies and founders that are trying to build their products in a compassionate manner. So whether they're building in the wellness field or not, they're intentionally designing their products in a way that keeps the well-being of the user in mind. And um, and that's been just fantastic work. We actually just finished raising our um, a fund one for $10 million, and we're focusing on pre-seed and seed investments. And um, it's been a phenomenal work. Can you expand on what it means to be compassionate? Like, what does a compassionate venture really mean? It means that you're being really cognizant of the other person's perspective and like what's best for their well-being. If you look at the basic social media is that products that just can, you know, capture your attention, make you, you know, really sort of like addicted, isolated, lonely. Like we know how to build things like that. But um, can we build things that can provide a great service, but simultaneously don't hurt your mind in the process, right? Aren't making you a worse version of yourself or aren't making it, um, you know, we want to be able to treat your mind as a beautiful place that we care for, not one that we're trying to damage. There's a, a wide variety of products like that. I think there's one in particular that we just invested in, bereavement company. That's like when you have a loved one that passes away, you don't quite think about how many things go into taking care of them as an individual, like, and simultaneously taking care of your own mental health while that's happening. And on top of that, taking care of all of like the legal aspects of who gets what and how is debt handled. And But this company, Better Leave, um, it basically aggregates all those things that you would need um, in one place to help you through that bereavement process so that it's not as difficult on you. And how is compassion good business? I think that's the, that's the <laughs> what we're trying to prove. Like I got really inspired by um, I think the clothing world is like one of the first places where 
you saw people care more about how their products were produced because the consumers were like, hey, I would love if my clothes are made by people who are getting paid well in a way that is less damaging to the environment. And I think that same type of energy we want to bring. I think it's going to work. When I started talking about community-based product, people always told me, oh, that's not, that's not going to be a big turn for investors. It's not going to be a big, big opportunity. And you sort of had to deal with a lot of crap from people for a long period of time. So you're very much in that stage where it's like year one of like, I haven't even heard the term compassionate you know, startups before, mm, compassionate mm -hmm. ventures. So you are, you're, you know, you're creating this category and you're proving out that thesis. And I think it makes sense because there's definitely this movement um, and you're seeing it on, on the forefront, just being on like writing your books and on being on Instagram of people wanting, uh, wanting almost like the anti products. They want the anti TikTok. Yeah. When we first created Wisdom Ventures, that was a lot of the conversation was like, we were, were hoping to invest in that next generation of social media that can help connect people without all these addictive like byproducts. I think there definitely has to be a different way. We um, simultaneously surprised and not by how much like investors just came up, you know, like investors came through and were like, yeah, like this sounds great. This is like a, a, a wonderful experiment. You have the book business, you have the you know, the Instagram social audience, you have the venture business. Walk me through how you think about each of the businesses. The Young Pueblo audience, it's grown over the years. Um, it's about 3.4, 3.5 million people now across all the networks. The books are all other opportunities for me arise from, you know, the quality of the writing that I'm putting out. Having sold a million books after having become a number one New York Times bestseller, it's just allowed me to like leverage that work to then, you know, be able to speak to investors in a way where, you know, they really take you seriously um, in terms of like building the venture capital company and being able to connect my audience to all of these companies that we're investing in and show them like, hey, like, you know, I'm direct directly investing in these companies, being able to give such a wide audience knowledge about that these companies even exist, especially at the startup level. That's like a huge bonus to them because I'm, you know, 30, 35. And um, I learned pretty clearly when I first started was that like you want to win people over first and institutions later. So that's why like the Instagram was so important to like get it out there and get pieces of the book out there floating. So to see if, um, you know, people were understanding that what I was writing. And at the same time, I decided to self-publish a book to see how it would do and it, you know, it went pretty well. I think it, I self-published my first book inward and it was out there for six months. Um, I think I sold like 12,000 copies, which is a, you know, a good amount. And it also kind of proved to publishers that, you know, this is worthwhile. So then I then, you know, I got signed, the book was re-released into bookstores. But to me, like whether it's a, a new book that I'm releasing or a company that I'm trying to build myself or some, or a company that I'm supporting through venture capital, like community is everything, you know, people are going to decide whether this product is valuable, they're going to test it out for themselves. And if it's good, they then tell their friends. And to me, that's been like everything. And it's the same thing. Like when you're an author, you do, you know, whatever book you have, you have a pre-order stage. And during that pre-order stage, you may get 5,000, 10,000, 15, 50,000 pre-orders. Then once people actually get the book and they start reading it, if they like it, then that 50,000 becomes 150,000 or 200,000 because they like it. And it's the same thing for a company. You know, they, they, you have a small group of people who test out a product and if it's enjoyable and if it provides a service that they don't already have, then it'll spread like fire. Someone asked me just before this call, how do you know when you have product market fit? And I was like, if you're asking yourself if you have product market fit, you don't have product market fit. You know, <laughs> people are going to be screaming it. They're going to want to tell people and whenever I make something, when I make a new book or when I'm working on a new venture, I'm always trying to tell myself, like, make something that's useful, right? That if it's useful and you want to like carry it around with you or to me, it's like one of the biggest compliments that I get about um, the books that I've written is if someone's like, oh, I always keep your book in my purse or I always keep your my book on your nightstand. To me, it's like, wow, that means that you find a lot of value in this book. And, and, and that's great because I'm hoping that these books serve as a point of inspiration for you to help 
you know, either improve your relationships or keep transforming your life for the better. How do you think about building on other people's platforms, like on, on Instagram versus, you know, a newsletter where you own the relationship? Man, it's tough, man. That's been the, the, the great conversation in the past. It's a double-edged like sword where outlet, on one end, it's really positive because like Instagram, you know, X, um, threads, like these places will be, you know, beautiful avenues that make it really easy to connect with other people. But then at the end of the day, you have no idea how the algorithm works. And because it, you have no control over it and you have no control over how these companies change, then those changes may not always benefit you. In the past like three years, I've been really focusing on just building a newsletter. Um, and I've found a home on Substack because I've become friends with the people who um, who have built Substack and have seen the depth of their commitment to how they're always going to keep that like that nexus of Substack where you have direct connection with your audience where you know you send something to them and they all receive it via email and there's no algorithm between you and another person and to me that's like so critical and I think looking back I feel like if I would have done things differently I would have definitely put a lot more emphasis on building a newsletter um in like starting in 2016 as opposed to starting in 2020. Yeah, when you talk to like James Clear, or Tim Ferriss, they always say like everything is about the newsletter. I think they're completely correct. And I and now I find myself like um, in a way following in their footsteps and like tracing everything, pointing it all back to the newsletter so that people know like if you really want to hang out, like that's the place where we should hang out. 100%. When you say like, you know, these businesses, you know, is it just you? Like, are you managing the Instagram? Like who's behind young pueblo oh be behind young pueblo it's just me and my wife so my wife was initially um she worked as a scientist for many years and um she actually took care of the two of us when i was first developing young pueblo so i, I spent like two and a half years not making any money and just like working on um working on myself as an individual and trying to craft my writing develop my voice as a writer work on my manuscript and eventually, you know, it sort of started picking up steam and becoming bigger and bigger. And um, she wanted more flexibility in her life. So she decided to start working with me. So I do all of the posting, all of social media, but she will handle the relationship with, you know, the different publishers that we have with the talent agencies, because I'm also, you know, um, represented by United, United, United Talent Agency. And we're considering hiring like one or two more people. But at the same time, like spoken to James Clear about this too. It's like he just has one person that he works with as well. I've heard that um, I think John Kabat-Zinn also has a similar sort of setup where like he just does what he can do. And, you know, if people have to wait a lot for him to respond to emails, like he just, just you know, has decided that it would make his life easier if he just is, you know, the one who's actually there typing everything. And I have a lot of respect for that. The publishers help a ton because they come with their own teams. But having it just be me and my wife, I think, keeps it manageable so that my attention can then focus on the venture capital world because that that requires just just me on that side. I think Ryan Holiday has a, a bigger team with you know the Daily Stoic and what he's working on. Mm -hmm. what, have you followed Ryan's work at all? And curious, like what you think of totally, totally, yeah, yeah. I've spoken to him. what you think of his model. I've spoken to him. His model's working well. I think it just depends on where you want your biggest revenue coming from. I saw one time Brene Brown took a picture of her team and it was like 20 something people. It was like tons of people. And when I saw that picture, one, I was very happy for her. Um, but then I thought about myself in that context and I was like, you know, I think I would just be like too stressed out by by having to manage all these people. And then I think I, there would come points where I would feel like, I'd have to write books just to pay all these people. That is stressful because then you, you're right. In a lot of sense, you're creating products to support them. And then it's like, am I working for them or are they working for me? I, I just spoke to a friend yesterday and he was telling me how, you know, he also um, is out there on Instagram, has more than a million followers, but he got to a point where he had so many employees that just his monthly overhead was over $100,000 in terms of like paying people. And he was like, what am I doing? You know, this is like, this is totally getting out of hand. And he had to totally scale back and, and, you know, for the right reason. 
I also heard that Alex Hermosi has and Layla Hermosi have been spending like hundreds of thousands of dollars a month on their content team. One of the things I'm thinking about is like, is it a chicken and egg type thing? Like, do you need to spend money to create content, to get the audience, to create the services? Like, what do you, what do you think of when you hear stories about like Alex Hermosi, who basically, you know, became popular via his content team? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it just depends on what type of um, content you're putting out there. If it's like business content that's specific and you're trying to get a quick audience, then it's totally possible. You know, you just have to spend money and hire the right people who who know how to like go viral because I think going viral is not like um, there's like a recipe to it. It's not it's not like something like uh, that's that's too difficult to do. I mean, people, musicians do it all the time. There's like after a while, when you become a musician, and you get good at it. You know how to write a hit. And like, you know, you can just look at Drake over and over again. There's like similarities between the hits that he puts out there. What's worked for me and what's helped me with my longevity to keep like chugging along has been to just stay as genuine as possible and to just like like the the, the center of everything that I do is meditating. So like I just have to keep meditating. Like I meditate two hours a day, one hour in the morning, one hour in the evening. I go to meditation retreats like uh, you know, a few times a year. Usually usually one of them will be longer, like thirty or forty five days long. And um and that to me is like that clears my mind enough that when I sit down and I write, um, you know, I write with the intention of like putting something that's actually useful for people. And then it all sort of works itself out. I want to come back to meditation, but who are some social media entrepreneurs you look up to? The dude who's like really the boss man is um, is James Clear. He made his bet and he bet on the newsletter and, and his bet totally paid off. I think him and Mark Manson, uh, like I listen to them really closely. I think I probably have more more social media followers than both of them, but they sell more books than I do. And and I think it's because of the way the way that they have set up their being more newsletter focused and having um, just fantastic content. Because I think when I think about James's, you know, his book, Atomic Habits, that book not only has great promotion with his weekly newsletter, but it's a fantastic book. It's it's just it's the book. The book is just phenomenal. Like you know, I've given it to people as a gift many times over, and they find it incredibly useful. So I think in in my mind that like I'm really inspired by that. Um, you know, when you bring that beautiful combination together of like a high quality product with fantastic marketing, then you're gonna have a tremendous hit. Beauty about Atomic Habits is there's so many rituals involved. Um, and he can use his content to bring back, like everything points back to these atomic habits, right? So he, uh, he almost crafted the perfect book with the, the perfect amount of rituals, with the perfect medium of newsletter. He uses Instagram in a really smart way where he always draws it back to the newsletter. I wonder if James Clear, like, was he really passionate about Atomic Habits or did he see the opportunity to build this ecosystem? Oh, that's really interesting. I, I have a friend who worked with him before um, before he released Atomic Habits. Who she, she worked at Business Insider and it was back when he would release articles. But I bet he learned a lot um, from releasing articles and just finding out like which ones were of good quality which ones like you know made sense and which ones people enjoyed and shared it with others and i you know i've learned from that and do like a similar thing with my newsletter where um i released a book called lighter that was my first uh non-fiction book longer form um where i really go deeply into personal development a number of chapters of that book are built off of uh newsletters that i released that um that i knew performed really well and so I would take that, you know, something that was maybe like 700 words and then built a whole chapter out of it. And I think using that framework of testing out the way that you set something up or what you write, banding on it in a book is like such a good way to produce a book these days. Yeah, I had someone on the pod recently, Nicholas Cole, and he's published 10 books. He told me a book is basically eight really good blog posts. Because I told him, I was like, dude, he, he was actually, he, he hit me up and he was like, you should write a book. And I was like, I can't write a book. Are you kidding me? 
Oh, you definitely can write a book, man. Come on, dude. dude your 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 posts go viral all the time. You can just take them and that's it. dude. I mean, it... <laughs> that's what he said. And then he was just like, "You've been writing weekly for years. You have to go back and just kind of put it together and expand upon it and and write examples." Yeah, I mean, question for you. I mean, selfishly, like yeah. someone like me who um, has a niche, you know, an area of expertise in a particular space um who writes writes on the internet who hasn't really been drawn so much to books because i love the instant gratification of you know this morning mm -hmm. i published a newsletter press publish and i got feedback instantaneously or you post a tweet and you get a thousand likes why should someone like me write a book books still sell like if it's a good book maybe five percent of books that are released actually sell a lot of copies but out of those five percent like some of them sell extremely well. If the topic is really good, people will give you their attention and they'll like read your book over a week or two week period. If they've trusted you for this long, then they're going to trust you to give you multiple hours of their time to be able to go deep into a book. And I think it's phenomenal these days. The fact that you can read a book like as a physical book, or you can read it on your phone, on the Kindle app, or you can read it, or you can listen to it as an audio book that gives people so many different ways to interact with it. And, you know, when you listen to a book, it's just like you're just basically listening to a podcast. It's been interesting the way that like, even though our attention is getting totally overwhelmed by our phones and by our TVs, um, at the same time, like, I think books are selling really well. The other thing too, is that, you know, you can leverage your work. Like, I think you'll, you'd be surprised that if you've written a lot over the past year or two years, you can just do the the sort of editing process rather quickly and just pull out like what are the most highly rated, highly valued, highly commented, highly liked things that I've written, put them out in front of you, and then you can start writing from there. That won't stop you from creating basically a whole new product out of that original material. So you just leverage that old material and deepen it, enhance it, and then put it back out there. And nobody will be upset. It'll it'll benefit everybody because the people who loved it the first time, they'll enjoy reading it, the deeper version. A publisher won't get mad that you like, you know, release that in some other fashion before because publishing companies, they're basically just venture capital companies. Like they literally will just, you know, they'll make a hundred bets and they, they're all like tiny investments to them and a few of them work out. So they're really focused on the, the investment that's going to pan out. And how has working with a publisher been for you like you mentioned your books now in, in all these bookstores and that's amazing on the mm -hmm. other hand i know how much being light is important to you and i would imagine that if you have a publisher you know they want you to publish as much as possible it's like having as you said a venture capitalist right like they it's they want you to grow and they're incentivized for you to to create a lot of content so how has been working with a publisher been for you and why haven't you self-published all the way yeah that's a great question self-publishing has great limitations like even though you make more per book with self-publishing the amount of reach that you get when you're actually in every single bookstore around the world your book is in airports that it's in like you know local bookstores everywhere that it's like that that helps so much more than just being on amazon because uh, I think Amazon definitely does the majority of book sales, but it doesn't do all the book sales yet. So having it in stores feels like a, not only like a big like personal victory, just because I've loved bookstores my whole life, but I think it increases the reach of the book itself. And I think it's worthwhile because you you had a particular audience, but then there's like a magic that can happen in the bookstore where people can see it and then slowly the the your book if it's being bought a lot in a particular bookstore, it'll work its way up to the front of the bookstore. And that doesn't quite happen if you only have an audience of like, you know, 100,000 people and they can only access it on Amazon. Um, so I think, yeah, bookstores are still quite powerful. Yeah, it's surprising how powerful the airport bookstore is. Oh, the airport is the big win, man. When big you, win. I like, it took me years to get into the airport, years. And even now when I walk in and just see like, I, only in the past like year and a half have I been in the airport. My wife and I are like, wow, like we did it you know, in the airport. Yeah, I, I just Googled um, Hudson, the largest airport bookstore in, in North America, and they're only in North America yet they're bringing in 1.8 billion dollars a year in revenue so yeah it's such a tight selection too like the yeah. selection is so tight 
in places also like um like Target, like if you can get your book in Target, you're going to sell a ton of books. For people listening, it's really about like what trade-offs do you want to make? If you are looking to reach the masses, it sounds like having a publisher is still necessary. For me, I'm just curious about the pro. Like I'm a curious person. So the idea of like, oh, maybe I'll make a book because it'll be fun to do. <laughs> um, and I'll just, you know, start with my self publishing and then maybe see where it goes. Yeah, I think it's I think it's totally worth a shot. And you'd be surprised. I think you can put out a fantastic book in like six months. It really doesn't have to be like the most like grueling, intense process, especially if you're writing from scratch, then it would take like two, two and a half years. Right. But if you've already been writing a ton, then all you have to do is basically start with the elimination process. Right. You can literally just go to your analytics and see like, wow what performed well and what didn't. And then that, that makes it really easy for you. <laughs> How important has the, the pen name of Young Pueblo been for you? If you went out as you know Diego Perez, not Young Pueblo, mm -hmm. would you be less popular, more popular, the same? Man, that's the great question. I think there was something about the pen name that was just like so different that caught pe a little bit more of people's attention. I see a lot of authors, you know, have pen names, not have pen names. But to me, it just felt like um, like it made sense, like because young Pueblo means young people. And it hit me so hard when I was meditating that like I was really immature, like I have a lot of growing up to do. But I have been studying history my whole life. And when I, you know, was examining like humanity, I was like, wait, humanity has a lot of growing up to do. Like we really do not excel. We have not mastered the basic things of, you know, that we get taught in kindergarten, like the the basic things of cleaning up after ourselves, telling the truth, sharing with each other, not hitting each other, being kind to one another, like these fundamental things that we're taught as five-year-olds and four-year-olds. We may be able to do these things as individuals, but as a human collective, we suck at them. We're like really bad at that. And I thought of this work when I was, um, you know, writing like my first, second, third book. I was like, it feels really important to to be, you know, even a small part of this like maturation of humanity that's happening right now. And I was like, okay, where can I help? And I, I thought, let me put the emphasis on personal transformation because as I've been studying more and more, it, you know, it doesn't like, the type of system that we have, whether it's, you know, a communist system, socialist, whether it's capitalist, you know, libertarian, if you have people that are like highly traumatized, you know, or people that are too self-centered, then it's going to be really hard to have a peaceful world. Um, so I think, you know, if, if we're able to develop our self-love and treat ourselves better, heal ourselves better, then we're going to be less inclined to hurt other people intentionally or or unintentionally. So, and part of that, you know, is not just with the personal transformation. It's also in terms of our relationships. Like if we can love each other better and we can be not only better friends to each other, but also better um, like intimate partners with each other, then there's going to be a lot less harm that's going to be reproduced in the world. So I try to write always with that mindset in, in the hopes that, you know, hopefully I can inspire individuals. Maybe that inspiration will trickle outward and help help humanity become a little more peaceful. And you think the name Young Pueblo, just when people are scanning Instagram, do you think they they taste a little? They're like, what is that? <laughs> do you, what, yeah, what do, you, what do you think go, you know, crosses their mind? I've heard a lot of different things. Like some people think it's like, you know, like I'm a big fan of, of Young, the psychoanalyst. Um, but I've never read any of Jung's books. Like I actually prefer Freud. I think uh, I've like read a lot of Freud's books. And then, you know, you hear one of the podcasts or something that I've been on and and um, you get a sense of like, oh, this, this is where it's coming from. There's like a, a, a bigger mission here. I think when you're choosing your name, a little bit of mystery is important because if you mm -hmm. think about it, it's a game for capturing attention. So you're on these social platforms, you, ha you have something you want to say, and your goal is to get someone to click your profile. And then mm -hmm. once you're on someone's profile, your new game is to convert them to follow you. So it's this commitment curve that I think you have. And that's why I think pen names are so powerful. I, I don't think we would be having this conversation, you know, New York, number one, New York Times bestselling author, if, it, if your name 
with something else right there. yeah you know i i i i love i love that feedback too because i think um there have been times when i'm like wondering to myself like why did i do that but i'm actually grateful to my former self when i um you know, decided to just stick with the pen name Young Pueblo reminds me like, oh yeah, this is just a project. So make sure that you say what's actually worth saying and that it doesn't become this like giant money game. Do you feel more free that you can talk as Young Pueblo? For sure. And in th- and also like I've been on a lot of podcasts. I've probably been, um, been interviewed on like 80 plus podcasts, but, but I don't really get recognized. I also don't put my face up on social media very often, only when I'm like, you know, if I go on TV to promote a book or something like that. I think it's helped me like maintain a lot of anonymity, which I'm pretty grateful for because I love just, you know, being in a supermarket with my wife and nobody noticing us. I'm really curious. So, um, Greg, how far does your um, like how big is your audience now across all networks? Um, Probably like 600,000. So not not huge, Um, but it's a very high quality audience. So it's a lot of people, a lot of business builders. Um, a lot of investors, uh, just p- people interested in creation um, and community. So I'm really interested now in equipping these people with like more tools and tactics. If I know something that other people don't and I could equip them mm-hmm. with knowledge to build these types of businesses, like don't I have to be in service to do those things? Like don't I have to give away all this knowledge? Um, and the reason I had that uh, sort of idea is just over the last few years I've had you know the crazy stories of people been like I was working at a McDonald's and I read one of your blog posts and I was able to you know create a business that's now worth eight figures you know I started this discord community as like a 17 year old and now it's a paid discord community and it's bringing in eight hundred thousand dollars a year and I was able to you know buy a house for my mom and all these like crazy stories of like hey I picked up on some information I applied the information so like just today we launched this membership called communityempire.co where it's basically, mm-hmm. you know, all, a bunch of my playbooks and tools and tactics and accountability calls for my team and stuff like that. And I want to see the, these people who join this thing, are they actually going to be able to create their own community empires? And I think I'm on this path around like equipping these people with as much swiss army knives as possible man i gotta sign (laughs) up (laughs) that sounds awesome i think yeah it's it's cool hearing about it uh about the way you constructed things too because it just sounds so smart i imagine is a lot of that like a lot of those numbers is it newsletter focused newsletter and twitter yeah the twitter algorithm treats you well i mean it's because you you give a lot in each post and i think it's more than other people I think that's why your stuff stood out to me so much. It's funny to me because just listening to you talk, you probably have like two books inside of you. I have two two books. Actually, I have the concept for them. One is Community Empire, and it's an expanded version of of, what, of basically the playbooks inside communityempire.co, um, which is how do you build mm-hmm. an audience? How do you convert that audience into a community? Then how do you get ideas from mm-hmm. that community to build them products that they're obsessed with? and all the different business models associated with it. My second book, I don't know if I want to say what the second book is. It's related <laughs> to the first book. I'll, t- I'll tell you another time. I love how I hit it on the yeah. dot. I was like, just listening to you talk, I'm like, man, you got like two books in you just right now. I think to, to like support your friend who told you you should write a book, I think you should definitely do it, man. Because I've noticed that when whenever I release a new book, my communities just grow, especially the first three, four months after the book is released. And a lot of that is from friends gifting the book, because you'll find that some of your best people that love your work, they're just not online. Right. people. They're just not people that like spend tons of time online. They're not that savvy with, you know, Twitter and whatnot. And they don't sign up to any newsletters, but somehow they end up getting your book through their friend. And then it's like, then then they sign up to the community. That's a really good takeaway for folks listening, which is when you're thinking about creating content, and that could be a book, it could be a podcast, it could be a newsletter, it could be a community. There's different strokes for different folks, basically. I just wrote a post the other day um, on Substack about uh, advice to new writers. And I told them, you know, don't forget that you're a writer first and foremost and not a social media manager. I find with like myself and with other people who are out there, is like they'll stretch themselves so far on every single platform that it's just de- sort of like devaluing and like 
they're spending too much time figuring out how to go viral as opposed to just just write something that's amazing. It's easier said than done because you know what you know what happens is there's a lot of creators and I'm guilty of this sometimes too where I'll see a type of post that goes viral and I'll be like, ah, oh, mm. like how come my stuff's not going viral? And I'll be like, maybe, maybe yeah, I should put yeah. this concept in that format. And then all of a sudden, like you're doing things for the wrong reasons, content first and algorithm second, not algorithm first and content second. You should totally. be pleasing the algorithm gods at first, especially as all this whole AI wave hits us and mm -hmm. more and more content feels very cookie cutter the stuff that's going to stand out is this unique remarkable exceptional weird stuff uh that it comes from being mm -hmm. yourself yeah I'm, I'm curious too sometimes we create these funnels where we know what our audience likes but we are also able to integrate what we like into that and then we post it but it gets so strict over time that you know it almost feels like um you're like losing 50% of potential creativity. People know what they what to expect from you. And since I've been breaking away from that, like being on Instagram and being on like threads and Twitter has been so much more fun cuz I'm just like, you know what? I don't even care. Let me just let me just post <laughs> and see what happens and it almost feels like in a way that I'm like playing around in a way where it's it was like 2016. But I'm wondering for you, like, when, you know, be, being at like 600,000, like, how do you feel in regards to like playing with format? Do you feel like you can? For me, so yes, I feel like I can. And I just have to be okay with some months I'm going to have really high engagement and really high virality. And some mm -hmm. months I'm going to have really low. It's just me in real time exploring my interests. I'm not a robot coming up with new ideas. I'm trying to add to the conversation versus curate i think what's really underrated as for entrepreneurs in general is just to have fun with what you're doing because if you yeah. follow the fun good things will happen and you can't take yourself too seriously <laughs> i love that yeah. man i think it's like it's the hell it's a healthy approach too and and with that like risk like you you have to be okay with you know the numbers going slightly down and then people kind of getting used to you doing things in a slightly different way and then they go yes. back up. But, but it's like, uh, you know, when you play the long game, all you have to do to be successful is just not yes. stop. I've seen so many writers just kind of like get burned out by the social media aspect of it and and they just disappear. They just like stop, you know, they, they stop posting and they kind of close that part of themselves. Yeah, you got to trust the process. So... I spoke to an yeah. entrepreneur the other day, one of the most talented designers I know, creator slash entrepreneur. He's actually selling, you know, he ended up raising a ton of money, selling his company, but he's not going to end up with much from it. So he was a bit down, down on mm -hmm. himself. And I was like, dude, don't be down on yourself. You're like 23. You're so talented. <laughs> All you got to do is just show up like, and you don't even need to show yeah. up seven days a week. Like you can show up four days a week, literally, and you're going to be a-okay and uh, and he was like yeah it's just like i wish i got like a few more million dollars from this deal no, no, no. and i was like you will not have to worry about money just create and and stay healthy and you can learn from your mistakes i want to end up on meditation because i know that's that's core to to who you are and sure. i honestly don't know what meditation really is can you define what meditation is i can define it in the terms that i know um, so there's a lot on different meditation styles will have different goals, especially the Vipassana meditation that I do. It's, it's definitely a high spiritual path that's supposed to lead out of suffering to get there. It's really just a mental gym. There, there are qualities that your mind has specifically qualities of awareness, non-reactiveness and, um, compassion that are ingrained in your mind, but they're not strong. They're, they're quite weak. And when you go to these silent 10 day meditation courses, um, and I'm talking about the ones in the SN Goenka tradition, uh, you spend three days just building your awareness. And that's, you do that by being aware of the natural breath, just to just stay with the natural breath and be with it. And, um, and that will help calm and concentrate the mind. And that really will strengthen your awareness. The next part is where for the next seven days, you start being aware of the truth that exists in the body by literally paying attention to all the sensations that are happening in you. And that will help 
uh, build this quality of equanimity, which I'm using the synonym non-reactiveness, uh, really balance of mind. And ultimately, that helps not only purify the mind, but it helps just clear the mind incredibly well so that, you know, whatever situation comes up, you'll know what the right action is to take. Um, and lastly, you build that quality of compassion, of selfless love, of, you know, um, of loving kindness where you, you know, you want what's best for yourself and for other people. And, um, and that becomes a lot easier with a, with a pure mind. But I really think of meditation as a mental gym. It's like you're, you know, you got to strengthen your mind because the, it, the mind can do a ton of amazing things, but most of those things are based around simply intellectualizing. But if you want peace, if you want clarity, if you want compassion, um, if you want like a higher discerning capacity, then you have to cultivate that. And if you if you want to learn this skill, is the best way to do it to go to one of these retreats? It depends on your on your capacity. It depends on like there's like a lot of factors. There are a bunch of different apps that will teach you know basic forms of meditation. Um, but if you want to really dig deep, if you want to go serious, if you want to sort of take yourself to that next level, then I definitely recommend doing a retreat. Um, and there are, you know, a lot of different styles of Vipassana as well. So you kind of have to just find what works for you. Um, but I found like I meditate in the same tradition as you've all know, Harari. And um, those those like, you know, 10 day courses will eventually build into like 20, 30, 45, 60 day um, long meditation courses. And they're incredibly powerful. Even you've all said it, which I thought was really interesting because him and I, we actually have never we never spoken um, but he said he would not have been able to write Sapiens without meditation. And, and it's funny cause I didn't even discover that I was a writer until I started meditating. Like meditating did something to my mind, just like kind of realigned it really well so that I could produce creativity. And, um, that literally wasn't possible before meditating. How do I find one of these retreats? Um, you go to dhamma.org, D-H-A-M-M-A.org. And uh, there are meditation centers in the same style all over the world. And um, yeah, you can just sign up to one. I'm checking it out. I'm actually going to Japan yeah. for a month. So maybe they have one in Japan, I wonder. They do. Yeah, they have a center there. Diego, this has been an absolute privilege and pleasure. Uh, if people want to follow you and follow your Substack, where could they go? Youngpueblo.substack.com. And uh, Young is spelled without the O in it, Y-U-N-G-P-U-E-B-L-O. You can definitely find me on Instagram or on X, on threads, you know, um, and my books are in bookstores everywhere. The newest one is called The Way Forward, and that one's available for pre-order now. It'll be in your favorite airport, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, thanks again.